now that we have talked about clipping let's move on to rasterization the stage where uh, the projected geometric elements are converted into a raster image so more specifically we will be uh, talking about um, uh, line drawing algorithms um, i will talk about one specific algorithm called the uh, dda uh, and then we will uh, move on to the more interesting polygon fill or triangle fill algorithms. Reading, reading again is from Angel. So like I mentioned, rasterization is the uh, stage where we convert the projected geometric elements, the geometric primitives into a raster image. Rasterization uh, is also called scan conversion. So this is a historical uh, reason for, uh, for this name. Uh, we will see this maybe in the next slide. Uh, this relates to the way in which images were actually displayed in, uh, um, in some of the early monitors and early display technology. So um, at, at the rasterization stage, our primitives have already been uh, uh, processed. They're already processed. Um, each primitive is specified as a collection of vertices. Um, and within the rasterization stage, we would like to identify which pixels lie inside this primitive. So note that these are the prim these are the primitives that already lie within the viewing volume and have already been projected. The output of the rasterization stage is a collection of or a set of fragments. A fragment is uh, essentially an unprocessed pixel. So the actual colors, the, the final pixel colors are determined at a later stage um, after processing the fragments. So let's talk about how to convert a line into a raster image. So we have um, a line, um, uh, a line segment in practice, and we would like to approximate it by a finite collection of pixels. Now, um, uh, this is typically done um, uh, um, using a very simple, um, and so this approach is called the digital differential analyzer. But before talking about the technique, uh, let's just understand what we mean by pixels. Uh, so this is the representation that I'm going to use uh, even later. Um, so it helps to take some time out to understand what we mean by a pixel. Um, a pixel, as you may know, is a, a term that means picture element. And so this usually refers to a um, area element, right? So a pixel occupies some space in your screen. And typically you think of it as a square or a rectangular area, which is switched on or off by your monitor. Um, so the when we talk about pixels, we often refer to it um, uh, in this form um, as a uh, uh, picture element. Sometimes it is useful to assign a single 2D coordinate to the pixel. Uh, so the way we, do, we identify the point uh, corresponding to this pixel is as follows. So here I am um, in this picture here, um, I am displaying a collection of pixels. Uh, let me draw the actual picture element, the pixels. So I don't need to draw the entire set here. Um, so 
so here is a single picture element right and you can imagine that there are other picture elements similar to this it's a better line um, and what I have shown here is the point that is used to represent the picture element so you can see that it is uh, the point lying at the center of this pixel right so uh, we will use these two representations alternatively depending on the context right so now we have this red line let's focus on the red line this is the line that we would like to convert into a collection of pixels as you can see this red line will pass through multiple pixels so our job is to switch on these pixels right so which pixels do we switch on that is the question and uh, what you can see here is the black centers of these pixels are the one that are switched on by one of the algorithms right so this is the goal of the uh, rasterization stage for lines um, so the reason this is called scan conversion is that the early display technology worked by um, switching on the pixels one scan line at a time so uh, so each scan line would be a horizontal or a vertical uh, line of pixels and they would be switched on by an um, electron gun um, and the electron gun would go bottom to top or top to bottom finish one round of a scan and then come back to switch on the pixels again so the way the algorithm proceeds is also the same way by scanning the pixels uh, uh, bottom to top or left to right so this is what we will see so the algorithm that we are going to talk about is called digital differential analyzer it's a very simple algorithm uh, we know this equation of a line y equals mx plus b um, so we know that the red line intersects the um, vertical lines at these red points so for example uh, the first um, uh, point of intersection is say x i y sub i right um, the next line of uh, the next point of intersection is x sub i plus 1 um, and y sub i plus m right where m is the slope of the line so we assume that we have m and b so the question is how do we identify which pixel to switch on right so the, the what dda does is um, if you are given the slope right um, it will compute this red point of intersection for every vertical line um, x sub i which is which takes values 1 2 3 and so on and it will compute the point of intersection x sub i y sub i and it will round off the y coordinate to determine which pixel to switch on right so computing each pixel on every vertical intercept um, uh, requires one intersection computation and a rounding operation right so that is the key idea very simple idea um, now of course um, depend depending on the slope of the line you may choose to use either the x axis or the y axis or uh, to um, compute the points of intersection so for example if you are in the first quadrant and uh, below the x equal to y line right so then in this sector what you would like to do is to increment x by 1 and compute the corresponding y values um, if you are in the next sector of the first quadrant you may want to increment y and compute the corresponding x intercepts and so on so this is a minor variant um, of the tda algorithm 
the DDA algorithm suffered from many disadvantages. The first one being that um, computing the, or identifying the pixels required costly rounding operations um, and several floating point uh, computations, uh, which we which people later found out that were unnecessary and that you could avoid them uh, uh, completely. So, so these operations were costly. Um, so you may you may wonder why we care about uh, floating point arithmetic here. So note that um, the number of pixels in your scene could e is easily on the order of a uh, million nowadays. And uh, imagine that these are the number of pixels that you want to write um, 30 times in a second, right? Uh, assuming 30 frame uh, per second frame rate. So that's a lot of computation. So you want to make sure that uh, um, rasterization does not take uh, a significant amount of time. A third disadvantage um, was that the uh, point of intersection was computed um, in incrementally based on the point of intersection for the previous uh, y-intercept. Uh, so, um, given that all of these computations used floating point arithmetic, there were there was error in the computation, and this error accumulated. So, this was another serious concern. Um, all these concerns were addressed by Bresenham uh, in an algorithm that he already proposed in the uh, late, uh, well, mid 60s. So, uh, the algorithms for scanline conversion, at least for lines, have been known for uh, several years, 60 years now. So, these are really classic algorithms. However, they still uh, form the core of any uh, graphics pipeline. Let's move on to talking about polygons, right? So, scanline conversion um, um, and the equivalent of scan conversion here is filling uh, a polygon. So, you given a polygon, you want to identify which pixels lie in the interior of this polygon. Now, this question is already uh, uh, not well posed because the, the question really is how do you tell which point lies inside a polygon and which lies outside. Now this may this question may be easy to answer for convex objects. Uh, in fact, it is well defined for convex objects. Uh, however, for non-convex objects such as this, like the star object, it is not even clear what we mean by um, inside and what we mean by outside. For example, here is a rendering with, where uh, uh, only these five triangles from the star are um, called as interior, so they are blue. Now, of course, in some uh, situations, we may want um, uh, this section of the polygon to also be uh, filled, right? So, so it's still, it's, it's really not clear uh, how to identify uh, whether a point lies inside a polygon or outside. Um, now, there are many tests available to decide uh, whether a point lies inside or not. Uh, one is called the odd even test, uh, which counts the number of crossings um, of a line uh, or a, a, rather a ray that begins from a particular point. Uh, in the region and goes out to infinity. Right? So, by counting the number of uh, crossings of this red line with the boundary of your polygon or rather the polygon, uh, one can decide if the point lies uh, inside or outside. So, um, the parity of the number of intersections tell you, for example, if it is uh, odd then you know that the point lies inside. If the parity is uh, even, 
uh, then you know that the point lies outside and so on right um, now there are several other tests um, uh, also available to identify uh, or to answer this in out question so we are not going to talk about such algorithms here um, what we are going to do is to focus on simpler primitives such as triangles where the question is uh, already simple and we and we will focus on the algorithm for uh, filling in the uh, the polygon or the primitive so let's take a triangle here which is defined as uh, using the vertices c1 c2 and c3 um, we already have uh, these vertices they are processed by the vertex shader um, let's assume that we have run the scan line conversion to find the points along the line c1 c3 and c2 c3 so in particular we know uh, when we are processing a particular scan line um, um, we have access to this point uh, or the pixel c4 that um, lies on the line c1 c3 and similarly we have the uh, pixel c5 that that lies on the line segment c3 c2 finding the pixels that lie inside the triangle is easy we just fill in all the pixels between c4 and c5 while marching through the scan line and while doing this we can interpolate the colors that lie uh, i'm sorry so the while marching through this scan line uh, so essentially the span of c4 c5 um, we can um, interpolate the colors at c4 with that at c5 now how do you find the color at c4 you can compute this by interpolating the colors from C3 and C1 while you are marching from C3 towards C1. So like I mentioned, we assume that the primitives are simple so that the scan conversion or the rasterization uh, algorithm becomes simple. So in particular, most graphics pipelines assume that the primitives are convex polygons. Um, further, um, graphics libraries such as OpenGL will also assume that um, uh, any non-convex con non -convex polygons are already tessellated and in fact triangulated. So we assume that the shade or the colors are computed at the vertices uh, for now. Um, and what we can do is to march along the scan lines and interpolate these shades. And uh, uh, while marching across the scan lines, we identify the pixels that have to be switched on. Um, in addition, we also know the shade or the color at this pixel. The incremental work that we have to do to decide the next pixel is actually small um, and further the graphics pipeline um, com computes these scan lines uh, or fills these scan lines in parallel. So more specifically, um, uh, we could maintain a data structure um, of all intersections for a triangle with scan lines and um, we could sort um, these intersection points based on scan line and after we do this we essentially fill each span um, in parallel so for example uh, let's take a triangle ABC uh, in a first step we could sort um, uh, all the intersection points between the triangle and scan lines. So these are the intersection points shown here uh, from 1 through 12. 
uh, we could sort them by scan line. So you essentially this means you reorder them uh, as follows: one, two for the first scan line, three, four for the second scan line, and so on. And now you can fill each span um, independently and uh, in parallel. Now, what does filling in the span mean, right? As I as I told earlier, this uh, uh, this filling in the span essentially consists of computing the collection of pixels uh, that constitute the span. Um, in addition, we also want to compute the shade or the color um, at these pixels. We could also compute the depth um, at these pixels. So remember that um, we never projected our uh, geometric primitive. Uh, we retained the Z values uh, after the view normalization matrix uh, was applied on the vertex. So uh, we would like to use these uh, Z coordinates, uh, but firstly we need to compute the Z coordinates for all the points in the interior of the triangle. Uh, so let's see how we do that. So here is a triangle. Um, that you see on the plane. This is blue triangle um, and it has two um, uh, points x1, y1, z1 and x2, y2, z2. And what you see is also the projected triangle in grey. Right? Now, um, so let's, uh, let's talk about uh, how the depth changes along a scan line, right? Um, and then we can uh, process the triangle one scan line at a time. So we know that um, uh, the triangle lies on a plane. So let's call that plane uh, using this equation ax plus by plus cz um, plus d equals zero, right? We also know that um, uh, a delta x plus b delta y plus c delta z equal to 0. So this is uh, uh, an expression which talks about delta x. So delta x is the um, increment along the x-axis. So let's assume that this is 1 on the screen space. Um, we know that along the scan line, delta y is uh, 0, right? So the question is, what is delta z, right? Um, so we know that this expression is true simply because the triangle lies on uh, that plane, right? Um, so from this, we can compute delta z very easily, right? Um, in terms of delta x. So, like I said, if you are in the screen space, then you know that delta x equals 1. Uh, otherwise, delta x could be um, something else. Um, so, your delta z corresponds to the change in depth as we march along the span. Right? So, this is how we compute the depth at each pixel. Um, uh, so note that this is just the increment to the depth, right? So you use the depth at the vertices to uh, compute the depth at all pixels in the um, interior of the triangle, right? We will also see uh, in the next few slides how this depth can be used um, to remove um, hidden surfaces. So that's the next topic that I want to cover, um, uh, hidden surface removal. Uh, the reason I cover this within rasterization is, uh, is, is due to the current state of the um, uh, graphics hardware. So in current technology, hidden surface removal um, 
is done in uh, at this stage, actually post the rasterization stage. Uh, however, the history of hidden surface removal uh, dates back to the early days of computer graphics and even before that. So in general, there are uh, two major approaches to hidden surface removal. One is in the object space, that's uh, 3D space. And the other is in the image space, that is uh, after projection onto the image plane. We will see one um, approach, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, so we'll, we'll see one algorithm uh, for each approach. So we will talk about backface culling, which uh, is an object space approach. And uh, we will talk about the Z buffer algorithm, which is which works in the uh, image space. Backface culling is a simple idea. Um, so the idea is as follows. Let's say you are the viewer and uh, you are um, uh, looking at a triangle. So you have the V vector. Uh, let's say n is the normal to the triangle. Simply by looking at the angle subtended between v and n, so let's call it theta, you can decide if this triangle is facing the viewer or not. Right. So if the angle lies between uh, minus 90 and 90, you know that the face is um, um, uh, or the triangle is facing the viewer. So what backface culling says is um, ignore all triangles that face away from the viewer. So, so essentially backface culling will remove faces that do not satisfy this property where theta lies between negative 90 and 90. Um, so typically this uh, you don't need to compute the angle obviously you just compute the dot product between B and N and you use that to decide which which um, triangles to display and which not to display. So backface culling essentially removes several triangles from, and, um, uh, from the pipeline, thereby um, improving the efficiency of the rendering. So in OpenGL, this can uh, be done uh, in a very simple way just by enabling this test for backface. Now, of course, backface culling is a nice approach, but it doesn't work um, out of the box. So one has to understand what it's doing in order to, um, uh, to, uh, to call this functionality. For example, it does not work for uh, open objects, non-closed objects. So if you have, for example, um, something like a cube, right? Um, whose um, um, front face is uh, open. So essentially you are looking um, into the cube, right? So what this means is that you will be able to see um, the back face of the cube. Um, and uh, this is that um, you will be able to see inside uh, the cube. Right, so 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 these are the inner parts of the cube uh, that you will actually be able to see. Whereas this is the outer face, right? Um, now, if, when you want to draw such open objects, you cannot use backface culling because a backface culling would simply remove the uh, blue faces and would not display them at all. Right, which is incorrect. So one has to be careful. So what is an object space approach? Right. Um, so an object space approach compares the objects in the 3D space and decides which one lies in front of the other. So for example, for the figures on the left, um, you know that either A occludes B or B occludes A, right? Uh, whereas for the figures on the right, you know that they, there is no occlusion and you can draw them independently in any order. So the idea is to uh, um, 
pairwise test the objects and then decide who to draw right um, so so essentially come up with an order in which the objects have to be displayed so that um, the occluding objects are uh, drawn later so for example if you are uh, in in this situation right so then you may want to draw uh, b after drawing a so that it overwrites uh, this portion right um, and vice versa for uh, for this case so such approaches are more complicated uh, but they have been studied extensively um, and the runtime for these algorithms is uh, O of n square because essentially you have to compare all pairs of objects to decide who lies in front. In contrast, image space approaches look at the final image that you are uh, going to generate. So here is a view of the image plane which is already uh, uh, shown as a collection of uh, pixels, so as a raster image, right? Um, the idea here is to look at each projector. Um, so what you see here is a single projector that goes through the center of projection naturally. So this projector uh, projects multiple points from different primitives here A, B and C um, and uh, generates a pixel um, on the uh, image plane. So the idea here is for each projector you find the uh, which among uh, A, B or, or C lies closer and you project that particular point onto the image plane. So uh, totally you have uh, if, if you if your uh, images of size n cross m uh, then you have um, an n cross m frame buffer and so you have n m projectors um, and let's say you have k polygons or k triangles um, then you want to find the closest among them for each of these n m projectors so the total time that you require for this is n m k so that's again a costly algorithm of course, this can be parallelized. So what we see in modern graphics hardware is something called the Z-buffer algorithm. Uh, so the Z-buffer algorithm is an image space um, approach um, which uses memory to increase the uh, efficiency of the um, um, image space based uh, method. So the memory that you use is called a depth buffer. So essentially we store the depth of the closest object that has been drawn so far at every pixel. So the depth buffer has the same dimensions as your frame buffer. Right. So what you see in the image here is um, your frame buffer. So the frame buffer is essentially where uh, um, a 2D array where uh, which stores your image. So each entry in the frame buffer corresponds to a pixel. For each of those entries, you also store the depth of the closest object that you have seen so far at that pixel. Now when you uh, when the next primitive is processed by the graphics pipeline, what you do is to update the depth at that particular pixel. So this updation is easy. So if the new primitive you are rendering is closer at that particular pixel, then you update the depth. Otherwise, you just ignore. Right? And um, if you are updating the depth, naturally you will update the color buffer also at that particular pixel. So that's essentially the Z-buffer algorithm. So uh, what the Z-buffer algorithm does is to modify the rasterization such that your 
depth buffer and and the frame buffer are updated only if you are the closest so in this example b is closer than a so all the uh, fragments corresponding to b um, so here so they will be uh, visible and uh, because they will override the ones corresponding to a so finally i also want to talk about uh, aliasing artifacts that could come up due to the rasterization and uh, some simple fixes for this problem so aliasing refers to artifacts due to sampling an ideal rasterized line uh, should be 1 pixel wide so it should look like this ideally right so it should be a collection of pixels all along the line but what we do if you recall is to choose the best possible y for each x or uh, the other way around and uh, this sampling or rounding produces aliased lines and al aliasing in this case uh, shows up as a staircase and you must have seen this uh, in several places um, what you see on the left here is an aliased uh, aliasing artifact and one way to remove this aliasing artifact is to color multiple pixels corresponding to each x so instead of rounding uh, so if you recall for every x value we uh, rounded off the corresponding y value to decide the pixel so instead of that we could switch on the adjacent pixels as well maybe with uh, lesser intensity and this is what is done in an anti aliasing uh, filter um, what you see here is a zoomed in version which is why uh, this looks as if the, there is an artifact uh, but if you look closely here um, uh, some of the pixels are black these are the ones that are switched on with full intensity and the neighboring pixels are switched on with lower intensity so when you see this at the appropriate resolution you will see really your eye will really see this as a nice smooth line this is one technique used for anti aliasing so what you see on the right here is the aliasing and anti aliasing artif uh, aliasing artifacts and the anti aliased line at the appropriate uh, uh, resolution so the aliasing artifacts are more prominent when you are uh, dealing with objects and their boundary such as what you see here and these aliasing artifacts can be removed with simple techniques such as what i discussed here so what you see here is much cleaner and smoother aliasing problems are much more serious when you want to draw polygons when you want to fill polygons or triangles like i said the uh, you already see the jagged edges of these uh, polygons um, but more importantly sometimes small polygons are completely ignored for example um, when you uh, display the color for this particular pixel the question is which triangle should contribute to this pixel so it's likely that this triangle is completely ignored and does not appear in the image at all so this could could be a serious problem uh, especially if um, you are rotating the object and in one view this triangle appears suddenly and then it disappears this causes serious uh, artifacts there are many solutions to this problem uh the the key observation uh while designing these solutions is that all the triangles or all the polygons here should contribute somehow to the color of that particular pixel 
especially if they all project to the same pixel and are at the same depth. So one way to solve this problem to do anti-aliasing is to use color compositing where you uh, blend all the colors from the three triangles to decide the color at this particular pixel. So you can look up color blending. Uh, this is also supported in OpenGL and you can do this yourself as well. Another approach uh, to anti-aliasing is via multipass rendering. So one way um, to address issues such as um, jaggedness of edges of uh, polygons is to take the camera um, and jitter it a little bit as in uh, perturb the location of the camera just a little bit uh, to the left and right, top and bottom and so on. Compute another image uh, and then a third image and so on. And uh, so essentially uh, multiple passes and then compute some kind of an average uh, image uh, which is finally rendered. So hence multi-pass rendering. So this is a common approach used even to compute shadows. So with that, I want to stop the discussion on rasterization. Uh, we saw a very simple uh, algorithm uh, in the object space and a simple algorithm in the image space for uh, rasterization for hidden surface removal. And for rasterization, we saw the simple DDA algorithm. Uh, and finally, we talked about the aliasing problems that appear due to rasterization.